welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the next episode of um, Facing the Tiger and Unleashing the, the Human Spirit at Work, a series of webinars with Dr. John Scherer. Um, and uh, this is episode number four. It's a, a very special episode. Um, let's see, it's November 18th, 2020. We're in a, a very interesting place. Um, Joe Biden has just won his election and it doesn't look like it's gonna be a smooth takeover from what we're saying. And um, um, UK has, is about to leave either EU and Poland where we are and a lot of other countries in Europe are struggling having a conversation between the right and the left. And here we are today talking with a very special guest, Barry Johnson, who's the originator of polarity uh, maps. Uh, what a concept to be talking about in this specific time uh, for the world. So um, hello, John. Hello, Barry. I'll turn over to you right now. Um, for all the participants, the plan for today, for today, it's not tonight for all of you, sorry, um, is that we're actually, we're going to be at this for about um, half an hour or so. Barry will present a lot of fascinating stuff to us. And after that time, we're going to turn it over to you for questions but we are inviting you to actually post those questions or comment throughout the webinar. And we're gonna try and answer those maybe even during the, web, during the first half an hour, but definitely we'll come back to those after. So post your questions as they come up, post comments. Let's make this as interactive as, as possible. Um, and um, over to you, gentlemen. Great, well, let me take a minute, Aggie, to say something about this guy. Uh, we figured out it was 20 some years, 20, 22 years ago, a mutual friend from Toronto, uh, all three of us are Gestalt trained, and he invited us to come and do a workshop for consultants in Toronto who were also Gestalt trained. So, so I went to Barry's workshop with these people like on Friday, and I went to his one day workshop, and then he came to my one day workshop on Saturday. And then that night over dinner, the two of us spontaneously created a workshop on Sunday, and it was just so fabulous. And from that time on, we were, we were like soul brothers, I'm telling you. So um, he and his wife, Dana, came a couple of years later to, to the leadership development intensive uh, to experience the full, you know, three and a half, four day program. And we got to the part in the LDI where we're talking about the persona and the shadow that exists. More about that maybe in our next webinar. And I walked over to Barry with a magic marker and I said, Barry, I think you have something to tell us at this point. And he stood up and just did this mesmerizing job of explaining polarities. And it has been a, not only a part of that program ever since, but it's a major part. part of my life and Aggie, you, you, we both said, I mean, literally not a day goes by, Barry, that, you know, that, that, and you heard the other people that you met on here before. So at the beginning, so make sure you all get this. This is Barry's new book, and you'll see why it's called And. He'll, I'm sure he'll make that clear to you. And just a little quick note at the beginning of this, we're looking for ways to get this in front of people on the Biden-Harris team as they come into office in America. So if anybody who's watching this knows somebody on that team, when you learn about what polarity thinking, the potential it has, we're hoping that you'll help us do that. Okay, Barry, um, I'm, I'm as excited as anybody else. Welcome, welcome to the webinar. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to do anything with you, John. It's a pleasure, first of all. So, so this is great. So let me give, uh, I do have a presentation. I want to, I want to create a context for this. Um, often when I'm presenting in various, various parts of the world, uh, people suggest to me, well, why, why don't you bring this to the U.S. Congress? Or why don't they know about this, you know, in Washington, in our capital? And I say, well, um, I haven't had, you know, the opportunity. And, <laughs> and, an offer. and so I tend not to be that promotional about all this stuff because I have enough people who just respond from word of mouth to continue to, you know, to be generating uh, interest and to explore that and learn from others about applying this. But what happened this, with this recent election, my son, Luke, and daughter, Shalom, have been very involved in creating this, this book, And. So they really got into it more deeply than they ever had before. And they, they uh, gave me a call and they said, why don't, why don't we try to intentionally see if we, can, if we can create a package that we would share with people, Republicans and Democrats, uh, but especially maybe focused on the 
uh, on the Biden-Harris new administration and see if we can get some traction for Ann thinking because we think it'd be useful. And I said, well, you know, go ahead. What do you got in mind? And they did some research and they discovered the new website by the Biden-Harris team on what they call their, their four pillars that they want to emphasize going into uh, the, the, new, uh, the new year when, when they're president and vice president. And so what we did is we looked at that and, and we thought, well, we know, uh, or we were able to identify an underlying polarity for each one of these pillars. Fabulous. Actually more than one, but we picked on one key one and we thought, well, we could build a message to the Biden-Harris team uh, about if you know, these pillars are important and what we know is you're gonna generate some resistance to these to the to what you want to do and and so we've got a way to help you address the resistance and the polarization in the country because a polarity works very well with in dealing with polarization and dealing with resistance to change so what i'm going to share with you is a draft of this this slideshow that we are in fact preparing and uh, we we just did the last pieces on it uh, about five minutes before uh, before I started this, this uh, <laughs> my first call with, uh, with John. So it's, uh, Luke is great at the graphics and uh, I hopefully can comply with, uh, with the summary of this. So let me just share this thing with you and we'll talk about it at the other end. But that's who it's intended for. Um, let me see, I got it. Um, who this is intended for are both Republicans and Democrats but it's focused on, and so the, the greater purpose here is a thriving United States of America. And this is a great place to just thank John for the fact that all of our polarity maps have at the top uh, what we call a greater purpose statement, which is a phrase that John coined, um, which parallels the GPS, uh, Global Positioning System. Um, and so uh, our GPS for this whole thing is thriving, uh, a thriving United States of America, and it's based on, on the book. So let's get into this presentation. Um, so the first point is making a distinction between a problem and a polarity. So a problem, for example, it requires or thinking. And uh, so if, if John and I were discussing, are we going to go to dinner to the Nostalgic Noodle or Wanda's Wonder Bar? Um, once we made a decision to go to the Nostalgic Noodle, we don't have to go to Wanda's Wonder Bar. And so the, the decision is done, the results are in, it's a one-time solution. So that simple decision about choosing either or is a foundation of virtually all of our problem solving strategies in which we have to make choices. A big complicated uh, question that we just dealt with in the United States government, of course, is who's going to be the next president of the United States. And we've, so we've gone through a very elaborate process to choosing one. But once you've chosen one, um, uh, then the decision is done until the next election, unless there's an impeachment. So, so problem, problem solving is very important and central and it's terrific. We all need to be good at problem solving. Polarities are a different kind of dimension. It requires and thinking, like inhaling and exhaling requires and thinking. Um, you, it, it would be foolish for the Republicans and the Democrats to argue over, are we going to be inhalers for the future or are we going to be exhalers for the future? Because in fact, we know that we, have to do both. Neither of them is sustainable over time. Now, this will be true of all polarities. So if we always flash back to, is this like inhale and exhale? If it is, then we're going to need to do both over time. And so let's look at, at some, uh, so, so, so or thinking is, doesn't make any sense at all because we're going to be blue in the face no matter who wins. So we need and thinking and we need to get the benefits from ongoing leveraging of a polarity. So um, I'd like to just talk about what I mentioned earlier. And thinking is especially helpful in dealing with polarization and resistance to change. Polarization and resistance to change. Those are the two elements. Uh, so in terms of polarization, I'd just like to share a couple of examples of how this has shown up in my, in my work and shows up in the book. So in chapter 19, I talk about uh, a team that, from Amico that went to Russia after the breakup of the Soviet Union and Amico became the only company initially uh, from the Western world to get access to Russian oil after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And a fundamental polarity that emerged was conditional respect and unconditional respect. Hmm. Another polarization issue shows up in chapter 26, 
where I was invited by the uh, then Deputy Chief Information Officer for the Department of Defense in the US military to come in and help manage and leverage a, a tension that was existing uh, within the Department of Defense, especially the information dimension of the Department of Defense about sharing information and information security. Um, so are we, going to are we going to share information or are we going to make information secure? And the, uh, the answer is yes. And so I was there uh, working with them on that. In terms of a couple of examples of resistance to change, one happened, uh, it shows up in chapter five of the book. Uh, there was a Fortune 10 company, a large company based in the United States, but located in 46 countries around the world. And they had a value about for autonomy in their business units. And they were located in 46 countries and they were having a lot of trouble trying to move towards integration of those business units. And so what they were trying to go is, go is from autonomous business units to integrated business units. And there was all sorts of resistance in the system. Uh, and I was brought in to help them address that. And we identified this polarity, autonomous business units and integrated business units. And that became uh, the way that we released some energy there and they were able to do both. A final one about resistance to change, it's in chapter 16 of the book. I was working with the South African National Education Office, and they were wanting to go from mother, their, their key was, we're going to go from mother tongue to English. They were trying to have English as the common language in Africa. Now, Africa, South Africa, has 11 national languages. So there's, all of them are, the tribal languages are called mother tongue. And so what they were trying to do was, the message was, we're going from mother tongue to English, and when, when I talked with them about it, they changed their language about, we're gonna hold on to mother tongue and English. And so those shifts radically changed in their process of trying to bring English as a common language to South Africa. So those are just examples of how polarities show up, come as polarization or as resistance. And so I'd like to talk a little bit more now about polarities and how they look and work with another basic example that all of us experience. We've got here activity and rest. And so if we just think about this, every day we go through some version of activity and rest. We get up, we do whatever we do to be stimulated. It's work, it's play, it's something uh, that's active. If we just focus, however, on activity to the neglect of rest, we find ourselves getting exhausted. When we're exhausted, we move to get the upside of rest and get rejuvenated. Now, it looks when you're exhausted, it looks like a problem and rejuvenated looks like a solution. But actually, it's not a problem with solution as much as it is a downside of one pole and the antidote to that downside is the upside of the other pole. So it's a natural self-correction when we're exhausted to go get rejuvenated and get some rest. But rest isn't a solution. It's easy to see that because if we just rest, we end up, you know, stay in bed for a few months and you discover not only are you bored, you can't even get out of bed. So there is a downside to each of these poles. So I'd like you to pay attention to that. There's a benefit of activity, which is being stimulated. There's a benefit to rest, which is to be rejuvenated. And the question is, how do we make sure we're adequately stimulated and adequately rejuvenated so we don't get ourselves overly exhausted or overly bored? So that's going to be the key with all polarities. So what do we mean by leveraging? Leveraging means taking something that a polarity that we're already living within and being intentional about it, seeing it as a polarity and being intentional about it in order to gain a, gain a greater purpose. So it's foolish to talk about, are we going to have activity or rest again, or thinking doesn't make sense at all because this is a polarity and we need to do both. We need and thinking. So what happens if you want to run a marathon? So, but if you want to run a marathon, you've got that as a greater purpose. This is John's contribution to the map years ago. So if you want to run a marathon, what you need to do, and this infinity loop shows, notice the arrows go high into the upside of each quadrant. We need to maximize the benefits of activity and the benefits of rest and minimize the downsides. So let's look at what those are. So if you want to run a marathon by combining these two, on the activity side, uh, let's say you're in a six month training program to run in a marathon. You're active in order to increase endurance and you need an action step alongside it to say, well, what am I gonna do to increase my endurance? I'm gonna run further most workout days. 
The other thing though we need to do is we need to also take action steps to maximize the upside of rest. The upside of rest is that muscles actually build on the rest cycle. So and that assumes, by the way, that you have been running further each workout day. So if you do the running, then the muscles can build on the rest cycle. So what do we do to make sure the muscles build? We get adequate downtime between workouts. So here we can see the first dimension of this. If you identify that you do have a polarity and you want to run a marathon, then you're going to be, need to both increase your endurance by running further and, and have your muscles build by adequate downtime. Maximize both upsides. Now, in order to minimize the two downsides, you need to know what they are. So if we overfocus on activity to the neglect of rest, we're going to have muscle injury. How would we know early that we're going to have a muscle injury? It might be as simple as feeling tired when you wake up in the morning and you think, oh, wow, I was, you know, got to bed really late last night. And so I'm supposed to run 15 miles today, but I'm, I'm really feeling kind of sluggish. Maybe I should just run 10 miles so I can avoid that muscle injury. The other early warning we need to pay attention to would be the downside of rest. How would I know early that I'm headed towards muscle atrophy because I've overfocused on rest? And that could be something as simple as missing a workout day. So if you're in a six month regimen and you miss a workout day, that's clearly not a problem. Um, but it could be if you continue to, to miss workout days. So that's why we call them early warnings. They'll let you know early so you avoid muscle injury or muscle atrophy. So, um, Another couple of points about polarities. If you overfocus on one pole to the neglect of the other, first you get the downside of the pole on which you overfocus. So for example, my son Tim qualified for the Boston Marathon in the Detroit Marathon, but between when he qualified for the, Bo uh, for the Boston Marathon in Detroit and actually running the Boston Marathon, he overfocused on, on his workouts and trying to reduce his time. He did it without adequate downtime between his workouts and he ended up with a muscle injury. He got uh, shin splints. So the first thing he gets from overfocusing on activity to the neglect of rest is shin splints. But now he also, by the way, gets laid up in bed. So now he's got muscle atrophy as well. So this is going to be important as I get into the future polarities. The objective is to get both upsides. If you do overfocus on one to the neglect of the other, you'll get the downside of the one that you favor or overfocus, then you get the downside of the other as well. So this will be true of all polarities. Notice, by the way, this doesn't make Tim a bad person because he overfocused on activity and all his enthusiasm to shorten his time, but it does make him somebody who can't run a marathon. Mm. So, so mm. let's just take a look at, at, uh, at this. When we look at the recent pandemic, uh, within the recent pandemic, um, we have a polarity between economy and health. And what we want is a thriving economy and we want a thriving healthcare system. Uh, but if we put or here, if we assume that we have to choose between the economy or healthcare, um, and we get this single point of view, it's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm, and this would be President Trump's point of view um, and a number of, of others who were concerned about the economy, this, this desire to make sure we have a thriving economy and the fear of an economic crisis leads to the energy going that direction, right? And so what happens is the drive towards thriving economy from an either or perspective leads to our health crisis in the United States with COVID-19. It's not an accident that we are the ones who are, who are the most- We're the world. You know, yeah, we lead the world in incompetency. And so where did that come from? I'm suggesting that it came from an assumption that you had to focus on the economy or a thriving healthcare system and you chose the economy. And in that choosing, you end up in a health crisis. Now notice what happens. Remember, when you overfocus on one pole to the neglect of the other, first you get the downside of the pole in which you overfocus, then you get the downside of the other. Wow. So, this is, this is what has happened as a quick summary of how did we get into the economic crisis by, by focusing on thriving economy. And this is how it happens. Paradoxically, you get what you're afraid of when you overfocus on one pole of a polarity. So we need and here. We need to do both. That's the message. So, so now I want to look at the four pillars of the Biden-Harris uh, transition plan. You can find these on their website. It came out just about a week ago. Um, so this is really fresh 
material in one sense uh, in terms of their, uh, their plan. So they have what they call four pillars. The first one is focusing on COVID-19. The second pillar is focusing on economic recovery. Notice how this already is a polarity that needs leveraging these two pillars themselves. Uh, another pillar is racial equality. And the final pillar is climate change. So from a polarity perspective, Luke and Shalom and I looked at this and we thought, well, what would be an underlying polarity that might, that might be relevant to each of these four? And we didn't have any trouble at all because all of them are written in the book. Um, and so what we put on the top here about what are these pillars supporting? It's John's contribution to the whole polarity map, which is a greater purpose. And it becomes the roof for the whole thing here, a thriving United States of America. Why do we pay attention to COVID-19, economic recovery, racial equality, and climate change? Is for this larger, greater purpose that fits for all of them. So what are the four polarities that we came up with? So under COVID-19, there's the, the, set, the generic polarity is decentralize and centralize, right? It's a version of the part whole polarity. And we decentralize to support individual freedom, and we centralize in order to support the common good. So that's going to be the first polarity we're going to look at. In terms of economic recovery, it's another, it's another version of the part whole polarity in which we talk about abundance for some and basics for all. Uh, in terms of racial equality, we're going to focus on claiming power and sharing power. And with climate change, we're going to focus on caring for the country and caring for the environment. So we're going to be looking at each of these four polarities. There are other polarities, obviously, that relate to each of these pillars, but we just picked one that we thought would be most relevant to explain to those who are going to be working on this. So we've got four polarities that represent essentially those, those pillars. So let's look at the first one, COVID-19. Um, so we've got uh, decentralize and centralize. This is a fundamental polarity in the United States. Individual freedom and the common good shows up in the form of freedom and equality that's right in our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal, uh, and that's on the centralized side, the common good, and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and amongst them are life, liberty, or freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. So from the beginning, there's a tension within the United States over freedom and equality. It shows up in this dimension in terms of COVID-19 around it shows up in individual freedom or freedom of the states to do what they want, but some part of the system, freedom of that part to do what it needs to do. Do I wear a mask? Yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly, or the common good. So if we look at this polarity, um, the downside of over-focusing on individual freedom or individual states to do their own response to COVID-19 is you end up with a disorganized government. You have states competing for, uh, for the materials they need for ventilators. They're competing with each other rather than collaborating with each other. And, and the fear of big government is what leads to over-focusing on this poll. So again, if you interject or in here, you've got that or mindset, you end up with disorganized government. And that's what we've got right now, where it's different in different states, it's different in different counties. And, uh, and so what will happen with the Biden-Harris uh, focus on this pillar, they're very likely to say, wait a minute, this has been way too disorganized. We need to go for the common good. So we've got this energy of going after something in order to get the common good. Um, and so uh, we're going to make everybody, for example, wear a mask out, out of doors. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to coordinate all the states. So there's all that effort, energy going that direction as a natural self-correction, which it is. My message to those going after this is that there's going to be resistance to that. And there's wisdom in the resistance. It's going to come from people who are afraid of big government. In the United States, that's called socialism or communism. It's afraid of big government. And it's going to say, no, we're going to hold on to individual freedom. Our businesses need their entrepreneurship supported and individual businesses to be able to do what they need to do. Again, notice how this parallels the economy. Same issue. But that resistance is going to be there, right? So what's going to happen in this tension between this energy going after the common good and energy trying to hold on to individual freedom, if it's a fight, if it's seen as an either or proposition, it will be fought out in Congress and it'll lead to the downside of both. The government will be disorganized and it will be accused of being too big. <laughs> so 
that's, that's what will happen. That's anticipatable from a polarity perspective. So what we want to do is use this energy that's going these opposite directions, put and there and say, how do we do both? And so we want to maximize both. In this process, my recommendation is that what we do is we first go to what is it that the Republicans are holding on to, the business owners are holding on to. What are they holding on to about this individual freedom and holding on to my 401k, letting my business doors be open? What are they holding on to? We need to clarify that and we need to appreciate that there's wisdom in that. How do we take care of individual freedom and take care of the common good? So that's, that's going to be the process for the rest of these, but you can see what's happening is there's a natural self-corrective energy going from the lower left to the upper right in each of these, and the sequence for responding to them will be the same. So let's look at economic recovery. In terms of economic recovery, again, we want to balance both of them. Um, but in this part, whole polarity, I'd like to say just something quickly about, about this economic recovery. Um, when you support freedom for the part to do what parts want to do, whether that part is an organization or that part is an individual, we support freedom and individual initiative. When you support that, you need to pay attention to equality. Freedom without equality leads to gross inequality. In the United States, we overfocus on freedom to the relative neglect of equality, which leads to a gross inequality. When we see this as an or, thinking either abundance for some or basics for all, what happens is we find ourselves with no basics for many. Now this has shown up in the United States. Um, the, the marginalized in the United States are experiencing the, the trauma of the, this pandemic much more than those of us like myself who are highly privileged uh, with sufficient money and security to deal with this. So we find ourselves in the downside of this poll with a lack of basics. So what is the Biden-Harris administration likely to do in response to this analysis? They're likely to say, we need to go from, from uh, no basics for many to basics for all. When I talk about basics, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about water, food, shelter, education, work, healthcare, and safety. Those are all basics. I'm suggesting that you can have basics for all, and that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna talk about how do we go after the basics for all? How do we support the, the fact that black lives matter? That whole energy is gonna go this direction, and it needs to go that direction. However, there will be a wisdom in the resistance to this move. The fear will come from this other point of view. The fear from those of us with abundance is that if we actually did allow basics for all, we're going to lose our abundance. This is often an unconscious fear that comes with the either or mindset when we're looking at abundance and basics. And that is in the United States, if we talk about basic, for example, just basic housing for everyone, the fear is I'm going to lose my really nice house because we're going to lose that, that really nice house. Or we talk about basic health care for everyone. Oh, I'm going to lose my choice of doctors. I'm going to lose the abundance I have in the health care that I'm used to as somebody in a privileged position. This fear of loss of abundance drives to holding on to something up here. And that resistance will be blocking the effort. This, that energy will block the efforts that the Republicans will have in going towards basics for all. Um, and it'll end up in that we don't survive, it just, we, just undermines everything. So what we need to do is have and in order to have abundance for some and basics for all. And again, the process in going after it is first to assert, to just say, look, this is a polarity. We can do both. You can keep your really nice house and we can have basic housing for everyone. How do we do that? That's a great polarity question. But assuming that we can't do both, in, in, and implicitly or unconsciously assuming that we can't do both will undermine the, gef, the effort to get basics for all. So that takes care of that one. If we, look at, if we look at racial equality, one fundamental polarity around racial equality, notice how the previous two also relate to racial equality. But here I'm talking about claiming power and sharing power. Um, if you look at, and we can do both, we can both claim power and share power, but if we put or here, and if we assume that 
that we can't both claim power and share power, we will end up trying to claim power and that leads to abuse of power. So how this works, for example, let's just take, take in the United States and John and my country's history here. So, so a Western, our Western European ancestors came to a land occupied by Native Americans and rather than claiming power and sharing power with Native Americans, we assumed that we couldn't both claim and share power. And so what we did was, it, we, under the claim of we need to protect ourselves, we use protection as a legitimization to claim power over and move Native Americans into reservations. We claim power over. And so if you win power militarily in your decision that I can't both claim power and share power, so I'm gonna make myself the most powerful possible. The United States government, for example, spends, spends as much on our military budget as the next seven countries in the world combined. Where does that come from? Our desire to protect and to, to assume that the best way to protect is to be more powerful than everybody else, that leads to an abuse of power. Um, in the United States, we had abuse of power by taking land from native peoples. That abuse of power got continued as we, as we looked at, and talking about racial equality, it continued as we brought slaves to the country in shackles and bought them to work the land we took from native peoples. So this whole process of marginalization happens when a dominant culture lays claim to power over others. And the, the, the amount of dehumanizing activity that is involved in claiming power over someone else is the amount of dehumanization we will attribute to them to legitimate our own being inhuman to them. So we call Native Americans savages in order to claim their, savagely claim their land. So, so this claiming power without sharing power leads to this abuse of, abuse of power, right? Um, so um, what happens in the Biden-Harris administration is they're, they're looking at all these abuses of power and they're gonna say, well, how do we share power? He did it, he, he did it in his uh, decision to have a black woman be, run as vice president. He did it during his acceptance speech for the first time an acceptance speech for president and vice president was led off by the vice president first and then the president. Um, so this whole claiming power and is going to be important. The sharing power is going to be important. Um, and so in this move towards direction, it will trigger a fear, the, the traditional fear that others are going to abuse their power and will find this holding on dimension. So what we're going to need to do is focus on uh, in this going over claiming power and sharing power, things will be increasingly polarized if it's seen as an either or proposition. And we need to have it be an and proposition. And so these energies can be converted into a both and. <clears throat> and so um, um, what we need to do is recognize this is a polarity. You can both claim power. We're not asking you to not have power, but we're asking you to share power. So for example, uh, the people, by the way, who will be most effective in giving this message are marginalized people. So for example, when women uh, worked for the right to vote, they weren't telling white uh, men, look, we want to take the vote and we don't want you to have the vote. It wasn't claiming power and not sharing power. It was about their claiming power as a function of sharing power. So we can learn from those who have been marginalized by dominant cultures who primarily been claiming power without sharing power. It's the marginalized who can help us understand this polarity better and help us do it well. So one final polarity here on climate change. Um, in, in climate change, again, what we want to do is we want to both protect our country and the environment. However, <clears throat> in the United States around this climate change issue, the, the, the either or mindset connected with this point of view um, led to neglect of the environment. So let me back this up for a second. Um, in 1997, the United States Senate voted 95 to zero to not sign the Kyoto Accord to protect the environment. And the rationale for that was that we would be, it won't be in the national interest. The question in their minds, conscious or unconscious, was we can't both protect the country and protect the environment, therefore we will protect the country. If we protect the country without protecting the environment, we end up neglecting the environment. <clears throat> and so what we, 
what, what the Biden administration is going to do is they're going to say, we're, we're, I'm going to, on my first day in the White House, I am going to sign you know, the Paris Agreement about climate. Um, and we're going to go after you know, the re reduction of fossil fuels, et cetera. And, and it's going to be a natural self-correction but from neglecting the environment uh, and uh, you know, Trump not sign, you know, unsigning, taking the United States out of the Paris Agreement, et cetera. So that's going to be the thing that they will go after, but there will be a holding on. And the message will be, you're going to overfocus on the climate to, neglect, to the neglect of the country. We're going to protect the country, so we're going to be holding on to something here. Again, what will be necessary is not to have this be a fight between an either or, it needs to be an and. We need to recognize that this energy can be combined and we need to start off first by recognizing we can protect the country and we can uh, protect the environment. But the first message to the, to the country is we are invested in protecting people's jobs. We're interested in how can we do that? How can we make the transition away from fossil fuels in a way that does protect people's livelihood and their families, that protects our country and uh, goes after a protection of the environment to prevent the climate crisis? So, so these are the four uh, polarities that I think relate to these four pillars created by the Biden-Harris uh, group. So I want to just summarize the pattern and we'll be done here. So what kind of a pattern is there? And let's just look at now the polls are, are Republican and Democrat. The greater purpose is a thriving United States of America. And within these polarities, by the way, there's a lot of Republicans that support both values that we've talked about in each of those previous ones. And there's and Democrats that support, they each support both values, but they can have a values preference. So they can lean strongly one way or the other. So what happened um, when, we, in, when you combine your values preference with or thinking, um, when the public, when uh, Trump was president, you ended up um, over focusing on some preference values by Republicans, which generated the negative results of that and the fears of Democrats. And now that we have a new administration, what do we do? We go from those fears, we go after the values preference that have been neglected. You know, we're going to sign that Paris Accord, etc. You know, we're going to have more equality. You can just see the list of things that are these values preferences. I'm suggesting there will be fears generated by that going after. And what will happen is there will be another set of values they'll be holding on to. And again, the struggle could lead to, uh, to failure. But if we can use and and maximize both, recognizing that we are encouraging Republicans, there's wisdom in their effort in what they're holding on to. What is it that we want to hold on to so that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater as we go after these other values? So Democrats going after a change based on their values and fears need to first listen to and include the values and fears of Republicans. What happens though, if, if, we, uh, if, the, the, <laughs> if the power of the, of the Democrats uh, going to the right poll and their values and fears get favored to the neglect of, if the, Republic, if the Democrats have an either or mindset as well, then you end up with the down the side of the, the Democratic overfocus and that will generate this resistance energy of going after. Um, so when the, uh, now what we're talking about is we're talking about the, uh, the Republicans say they initiate something. There's something that they're gonna go after. We're gonna go after X, whatever that is. When they make that change, they will generate fears uh, from, the, uh, from the Democrats who will now, the Democrats are the ones holding on. The Republicans are trying to put some legislation through, but the Democrats are saying, wait a minute, if you do that, it's gonna threaten our values. So now, uh, again, the struggle will lead to dysfunction, but if we put and there, we're trying to manage both, what do we do? We ask the Republicans to listen to the Democrats. What is the values they're trying to hold on to? And for the Democrats, I mean, the Republicans to assure the Democrats, this is how we're gonna hold on to the values that you're trying to hold on to, because they are important. And this is how we're going to go after our values. So the reverse has now happened. The Republicans going after a change based on their values and fears need to first listen to and include the values and fears of Democrats. Um, so final summary here. And thinking is especially helpful in dealing with polarization and resistance to change. Polarization. Chronic polarization is a key indicator of an underlying polarity. 
within this polarity, both sides will be right and will need each other's wisdom over time. Secondly, or thinking with polarization will create a vicious cycle in which everyone loses. And thinking can create a virtuous cycle which lifts the system from polarized to optimized. In terms of resistance to change, within a polarity, there will be wisdom in those going after the upside of one pole, and there'll be wisdom in those resistance by resisting by holding on to the upside of the other pole. Secondly, or think, using or thinking with resistance to change will increase the resistance. The clearer the communication, the greater the resistance. And finally, and thinking will increase the speed, attainability, and sustainability of the change. So this is why it's so important to supplement or thinking with and thinking because of the need in order to address both polarization and resistance. And we have a process for doing this. The best way to address chronic polarization and resistance to change is to apply and thinking to identify and leverage key underlying polarities. And it's a small five-step process. First, we need to see that it's a polarity. Second, we need to map it to appreciate well there really is an upside and a downside to each. Then we can assess how well are we doing it with leverage with this. We learn from that assessment and then we do leveraging which is in, involved in taking action steps for both upsides and identifying early warnings for each downside. And we need to engage key stakeholders um, every step of the way. So that's all in this book uh, before, <laughs> before the crisis came, but the, uh, the polarities were there long before then. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and we can go back to, uh, to our conversation. Wow, Barry. That is amazing. Listen, I don't, you, you've been presenting, and while you've been presenting, right, Aggie, there's been a fabulous conversation going on in the chat box. What do you, what do you think, Aggie? What, what, you, want, you want to grab a couple and bring them forward for Barry? Um, sure. Um, uh, we have somebody raising their hand, which I don't know if it's possible. I, if I can um, make it possible for that person to speak. Um, sure. I can do that. And then um, since uh, Barbara, people were raising her hand, let me, let me say that. Barbara, can you hear us? You need to unmute. So Hi, Barbara. Did you show me as having my hand raised? Yes, I did. Oh, I am so sorry. I must have bumped <laughs> something. <laughs> you did make some comments during the conversation, Dal. Did you want to bring some of those in, into here as questions? Um, well, I've, I've known Barry for, for years as well and, and have loved his work uh, since we uh, met at the World Future Society in the 1900s. Oh my gosh, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> it does date us, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Um, but I, I, I think this work is important, but Matt's comment about we're not in a, mental, a mentality where win-win is the dominant uh, driver. There, there's an awful lot of, I don't really care whether I win, I'm in the scorched earth mode, right? So as long as you lose, I don't care how much smaller the pie gets. And that, that sociopathic tendency that, that we're seeing come out, is kind sure. of frightening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. So, if I can post that question, Barry, the question from Matt coming from Matt was actually about the, you know, how do we engage when the other side is not interested in a win-win, when their their main intention is to make the other side lose? Um, well, the um, uh, I, I don't want to be overly simplistic about this. Um, I just uh, want to say that the polarity lens will be relevant in the process. So you don't engage either or thinking with your counter either or thinking. Um, that will just exacerbate it. But what, what I think is important for those people who assume that you can't both claim power and share power, what you need to do is organize to claim power and then share it. Mm. So, so they can experience the fact that you can claim power uh, and it can be shared by somebody who actually claimed it and shared it because you don't have experience in your process of claiming it. You've never learned how to share it. Yeah. So <laughs> you haven't experienced the reality that there's another option. So for example, when, uh, 
when uh, Nelson Mandela became the first president, black president, uh, black South African president of South Africa, the black majority elected him president. The black majority who now finally had the vote had the power. The question is, are we going to share it? Now, in South Africa, as significantly different, by the way, from some other countries in which when the black majority took over, um, it, 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 would, it would be a power switch in which you just confiscate all the land, you may just kill all the white people. And that's, that, that's an alternative that was, was avoided by, uh, by Nelson Mandela saying, actually, we can share the power. We will not take over these businesses, but we are telling you that there, there is a mandate and we're watching you that you need to diversify your ownership, your leadership in those organizations. But we're not going to just take them over. So, so we are claiming power and we want to share power. We're not saying you don't have a vote. Of course, you've got a vote. Everybody's got a vote. Um, so this is, is a very important realization that, that the marginalized need, we need to organize with the marginalized in support of them taking power with the assumption that it will be shared. We already know it's not being shared by the dominant culture. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so the real relief in this polarity will come from uh, uh, those in the dominant culture who collaborate with the marginalized culture to do, take a different focus to claiming power and sharing power rather than claiming power or sharing power. Mm, so you, you need to vote, you need to vote President Trump out of office. And then when you do get in power, you need to be able to be willing to share it with Republicans rather than be in that either or mindset. Yeah. I think, we, uh, gosh, we have so many questions up yeah, here. No, so much. Yeah, we definitely need another conversation. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of comments that say, well, what if the Republicans just say, aha, they're, they're going to share power. Now we got, now we can get in there and, you know, you know what I mean? We can use this now to sabotage. And, and that's, a, you know. Yeah, you, 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 uh, you, can't, you can't use uh, and thinking uh, to sabotage and thinking. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, uh, if, you're, if you're living in the, in the either or mindset and you assume you're going to use and thinking, which, which says basically you need to share power, you need to empower both poles. Um, the, uh, the reality is, you know, you, you need to share power with both poles or it won't work. Yeah. So, so it'll, um, you, you'll, you know, there will be efforts. There will be a lot of people who will not be able to understand what I'm talking about here, clearly, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's understandable. The, so the task for all of us who believe that and thinking is useful is the question, well, how do we communicate it in a way that is loving, that is inclusive, and that um, increases the likelihood that others will see the potential uh, of and thinking? The assumption is that if I could see President Trump, if I could see anybody, any person, any organization, any country, if I could see them completely, Love is just a natural byproduct that just comes with the territory. And, mm -hmm. and a polarity lens helps us see people more completely. Mm -hmm. And your work, John, helps us see ourselves more completely by dealing with our shadow, owning our shadow, and dealing with it. And, and so when we own our shadow, as you help people do, um, we don't need to project it on somebody else anymore. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's like... It's, it's like, a harder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's, we don't have that, that need to do that. False. Mm -hmm. So what well, polarities are then, um, I would say, you know, starting with the leadership, then they're, they're spread down. And somebody here, Carl Albright, is actually asking a question about, about the media. So how do we uh, apply the polarity concepts to the toxic media environment that is polluting the national conversation in the U.S.? And this is not just about the U.S. This is worldwide today. Yeah, I made a presentation uh, in, in 1990 to to the American Press North American Press Association uh, as actually the Press Association of the Americas it was in Mexico so all the at this time it was it was uh, maybe may, uh, essentially newspaper publishers from North and South America and I talked about the need in the news from a polarity perspective to to pay attention to both both sides of issues that were being that were being articulated and to give them 
you know, is, so what the media could do is say, this is what one side is saying, this is what the other side is saying, and taking a look at what was, what was the wisdom within them. And the media could do that rather than just choose a side and, and imply that there is only one side. Now, well, what's I, I don't think they got it, Barry. They didn't get I, it. No, no well, uh, <laughs> well, exactly. Um, a lot of people don't get this. I've been doing it for 45 years now, but uh, hope reigns eternal. The nice thing about it is, for all of us, is that polarities are an, an, an energy system in nature. Built in. Um, it's built in. So even if we don't do it as effectively as we'd like, which is often true of me, I don't do it as effectively as I would like, and I'm sort of embarrassed about it. But what, I, what, what saves me is I think, actually, the phenomena is still there. I may not have represented it well, but it isn't going anywhere. It's like gravity and sunshine. It's just a gift to all of us. It's just like God's love. It's just, it's just there, you know? And so you don't have to, you, even if you blow it, the polarity is right there. And, and you have another chance again and again to do it differently, better, however you want. You know, Barry, when I put the greater purpose up there, it was because it became clear that for people to be willing to go into their shadow and, ex and explore the potential benefits or that might be embedded over there, they needed to have a really good reason because it had to be so big that it would offset the predictable uh, outcome that might happen down there. Yes, the other thing they need is they need support. They, two more things they need. Absolutely right, what you've said. Two more things they need. One is they need a platform from which to go. And the platform is actually the upside of the pole that they're hanging on. So it's like, you know, it's like the, and the fear of that downside. So you need, to, you need to say there is an upside to this. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they need, that, they need that platform and they need a setting which supports them to engage that shadow. And that's what you provide and everybody involved in your leadership development model. You provide a setting in which people feel cared about. They can see their shadow. They can, they can deal with it and come out the other side and discover that they have not been harmed in the process. Yeah. And you only know, you only know your, your relationship can survive a fight after the fight. And you only know you can survive the shadow after you've survived the shadow. Yeah, there's a safe space in which they can do that. I think, Barry, the burning platform quite often in the, in the organizational work that we do, mm -hmm. you know, the motivator is we have a burning platform, right? And what I'm afraid, I just don't want to see America or any country, uh, you know, essentially begin to disintegrate and finally be such a huge crisis that the, 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 the two sides are willing to say, okay, let's share some power. You know, how bad, it, how bad is it going to have to get before we start to practice what you're talking about? Yeah, well, I, I think the, I, the, the willingness to share power will not happen, will not happen by somebody who assumes an or, an or posture towards power. So now it has to be, turn. it's our turn now. It, 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 it has to be taken from them yeah. by those who are willing to both claim power and share power. Yeah. But, when, but that's, this is something that Dr. King knew, anybody who's been involved in movement politics, know that it's not gonna be given away. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to go after it. The question is how you go after it and what you do with it when you gain it. You know, Barry, one of the things that we teach in, in, in the LDI is we use Aikido as a metaphor, which I think is a brilliant application of what you're talking about. Like when somebody comes at you, they're giving you an opportunity to practice, right? They're giving you an yeah. opportunity to learn something. And so yes. your first thing is to blend and then turn and face the same direction as your attacker to say, let me look at this from your point of view which I like, what's the germ of truth that the Republicans have or the Democrats have that the other side is not willing to look at? This is really lovely. Yeah, yeah, I agree, John. Great, great analogy. We got so much here. I don't even know how to mine this. Is there any way we can keep the <laughs> chat box? Is there some way to print the chat box or make it available or something? How do we, I don't know who to ask. I'm asking my- yeah, you, you, can, you, can save, can, you can save the chat box, yeah. Okay, then I commit that we will save the chat box and I think we have their, your emails and we'll, we're gonna send you a link to the video of this. And if we can at the same time, we'll send you the chat box because there's some really great stuff here, Barry. I don't know how we could, you know, this is worth a whole workshop here. I don't know how we could do this. Yeah, well, yes. And I'd be, <laughs> in terms of people putting things in the chat box, I'd appreciate any suggestions that you think um, I, um, I'm, I'm wanting to have this be a document that Republicans would feel respected in and would be willing to 
yeah. uh, to give it a look. Some of the moderate yeah. Republicans might say, come on, look, guys, let's do this, or gals. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that, it's, that it's worth paying attention to. And they're not, they are not um, uh, identified as, as, uh, as sort of evil or some yeah. uh, notion. In the, in the section, in the section of, the, of the book where I talk about no evil source, this is fundamentally important. Um, we, we uh, and this is not, the not evil. They're afraid. Uh, they're not evil. They're afraid. Uh, that would yes. be. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and fear leads to lying, by the way. Yeah. So if you've got somebody who's lying a lot, you've got somebody who's very afraid. All right. We got one more minute, Aggie. I'm going to throw it back to you, but I want to say Barry. Well, I mean, Barry, people are just, I, I, want, to, I want to express this appreciation. We're getting a lot of people saying, thank you so much. This was a wonderful um, experience, uh, best webinar ever, and so on and so forth. And it, it seems like we've created a lot of inspiration in people uh, today. So um, uh, big thanks for that. Um, and somebody's asking if your book is going to be available on Kindle anytime soon. It won't be available in Kindle because it has too many graphics in it. Yeah. Right. It's full of graphics. It's, you know, it's just loaded <laughs> with graphics, really. It's just bad. <laughs> it's got a lot of polarity maps and, and sub maps. Yeah, I, love and stuff. It. I love it. <laughs> and so Barry's going to be back on this webinar in two weeks. We're going to do a follow up to this. And the intention is we looked at macro issues like governments. In the next, we're going to look at more intimate things like relationships at home and at work and the various polarities, me and the team, me and my family, me and my spouse. You know, what are some of the polarities at a more intimate level? Yeah, some of the questions we had in the chat box today were related to actually, can you, can you now talk about the most common polarities uh, you're witnessing in business today and the businesses are facing? And I think that would be a great question to come back to in two weeks, which, okay. thank you, John, is a great segue to uh, re reminding all of you to see us in two weeks. Um, it will again be a, a Wednesday, two weeks from now. Um, you all receive- um, And invite email, your invitation. friends. Invite your friends, yes. Invite your friends and let the world know that we will be uh, once again speaking to Barry Jackson, John Johnson two weeks from today. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Aggie. Thank you, Thank all you. of you. Thank you for the invite. I loved it. Great to be with you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great night or a day. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Thank you, John.